life so fixated and so busy that I miss what God is wanting to do, that I miss the people around me. Just, the, the crazy thing about life is that it's easy to make it about the things that we do, the things that we're having to work for, run after, stuff that we just have to work out. And we miss out the fact that life is about people. You know, church, the community, the gathered, it should be about people. It's not about programs. It's not about putting on events. It's not about how good we do things. Ultimately, God cares about people. And it really struck me at our prayer time on Monday. And if you don't come to our prayer times, I really want to encourage you to be part of them. These are times when we capture something of the heart of God and we pray into his will. You know, we bring our kids along, so feel free to bring your kids if you want to. It's open for everybody. And I, I was just there and I was just listening to God and I was just struck once again about people. And God's desperate love and desire that he has for people. He doesn't give us stuff really about some of the things that we do. But he does care about who we are. He created us to be like him in his image. And through this broken, messed up, sinful world, it has been fractured, distorted and broken. And we live in a world of pain and hurt and brokenness. And there are real people with real lives sitting in this room today and we may not even know what they're going through because we are so absorbed with what we are doing. I just felt, God, remind me, are we able to see beyond ourselves? Can we be more God-conscious rather than self-conscious? Can we be more motivated by God's love than our own love for ourselves? And I just feel that's something God wants to stir in us as a church. We had this, these guys came and spent some time with us, this uh, mission team spent some time with us over this week. And, you know, they were such a blessing, such an encouragement. And, you know, they, they, they served and they showed God's love in action. But, you know, one of the things they said is that they saw it in us too. Do you know, I was really blown away by that. They said everyone that they'd met, they saw how much they loved God how much they were living it out for God. So I want to encourage us this morning that we are beginning to walk in this thing that God is asking of us. And I just feel God is wanting us to take us more and further and deeper so that every single day we are in tune with what the Holy Spirit is wanting to say and do, that we are recognizing that, you know, I stand here today or we serve in the coffee shop or we serve in power or or we're doing the stuff amongst the kids and the youth or we're out in the community because it's real life, real life real people that God loves and cares about and wants to know. You've you've heard me say it probably hundreds of times that there's a truth. Jesus is coming again. I want us to really to be motivated by this truth. Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, there are no more opportunities. I don't want us to think that there are any more opportunities. There's a guy that came in this morning, and uh, Sandy introduced me to him, and I was just sharing with him, and God's obviously working something in his life. Uh, I didn't feel he wanted to stay this time, but maybe another time, and so we really pray for him. And one of the things that he said is he He wants to, he knows there's something, he needs to engage, there's lots of stuff going on in his life, but he wasn't quite ready yet. And I was just encouraging him to, you know, just come and find out, plug in, sit just even for a short time if if that's all you can do. Because Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, there are no more opportunities. Are you moved by a sense of urgency that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever might believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life? Are you moved by the fact that there is an invitation for people today to know Jesus but when he returns the invitation is no longer there when Jesus comes he will come with fire 
See, the Holy Spirit has already come and he comes with fire to refine us, to make us like Jesus. But when Jesus returns, he will come with a fire of judgment and there will be no more opportunities. There is a fire coming. And are you moved by the fire of the Spirit today so that others will miss the fire of Jesus' return? And some say, well, you know, why? How can that be? You've just said that God loves people. How can God love people and not spare them when he returns? Because one of the things that we believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is this, that God is who he says he is. God is always true to who he is. And he never, never goes back on his nature. And his nature is holiness. And this is a word that we don't really fully grasp. What does it mean to have a God that is completely absent from sin and evil? Completely pure. It means that he cannot entertain unholiness, sinfulness. Oh, I just say a little white lie here, or I maybe cheat my taxes there, or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, the truth is... We are allowing sin to consume our life of which Jesus wants to set us free from. And God is holy above everything and anything else. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah had something of a revelation of this God. And, and, and you read about it in Isaiah 6 and he's, he sees the Lord. He sees this picture of God high and lifted up. And, and the train of his robe, the, the, the robe in which he was wearing was filling this temple and it was full of fire and it was full of smoke. And he goes, whoa, it's me. I cannot stand in the presence of this holiness. He grasped something about this almighty God. And prayed that this, or, or shared with us during the worship, this whole idea about not fearing man, but fearing God. That's not just a reverence. This is a God that, that consumes, not because he hates, but because he loves and he wants us to be free from sin. And so he has to deal with sin. Do you know, one of the things that struck me is that God's heart breaks every time somebody is lost without Jesus. It says that he desires none to perish, but all to come into everlasting life. And he has made a way through his son, Jesus Christ. And the reason when he comes again, there is no more choice for us is because we chose hell. We chose to reject him. And we chose our own destiny of punishment and judgment. And Jesus God the Father has to be true to who he is and it breaks his heart. But it, because he is true to who he is, it means we can trust him and trust everything that he says. How stirred are you by the fact that Jesus could come any moment? You know, there's this crazy, you know, look, this C19 virus thing. I, I don't want to say anything that offends anyone this morning. But you know, there's such craziness going on. You know, people, you know, going crazy buying, you know, fear buying. I'm sorry if that's you. You know, it doesn't matter, stuff everyone else, I'll take all of the stuff. You know, it's kind of selfish. Fear always creates selfishness anyway. You know, and I look at the fact that we have a God who is almighty. A God where, where, which teaches us that we have to fear nothing else. A God that says our days are allotted and numbered to us. I'm not talking about just being reckless and jump off cliffs here. But knowing who God is in our life. Knowing that there is a greater and more desperate reality coming. You know, people are running around, you know, have you heard this? Should we sort this out? When we should be going around, have you seen our Jesus? Do you know about this Jesus? You might be worried about this virus, but there's a Jesus who can love, who can be part of your life. Who's, and we're more talking about viruses than we are Jesus. And we've got something wrong. We see something similar going on in the, 
book of Genesis with Noah. <laughs> As we get into Genesis 6, open up please to Genesis 6. Verse 1. How easy it is to miss what God does and get caught, what God's doing and get caught up in our crazy, worldly, crazy world. Genesis 6, 1, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives and they chose, any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. For his flesh, his days shall be 120 years. They were living up to, you know, eight, 900 years old. He's reducing their years down. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who reviled the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I, won't, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth. And behold, that means pay careful attention, it, this world was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. I would destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher woods. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. It's breath breadth, sorry, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark to its side. Make it with lower second and third decks because pay careful attention to this. I am going to bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Noah, living in this corrupt time, could have quite easily have just got on with the life that he was living and missed what God was doing. But he was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He was a man that walked with God. He had favor in the eyes of God. And he was ready. He could hear when God spoke. And he was ready to do whatever God asked of him. Opposed to everybody else around them. Thousands of people merrily going on in their own lives, self-consumed by their own destinies. They miss what God wants to do. Now when we look at this passage, there's so much we could talk about. Oh, we could talk about the Nephilim. You know, were these, these giant-like creatures... And did they come about because of demonic angels having sex with the, the women that were there and they gave birth to these mighty warrior giants? Was, is that what the Nephilim is? Or were they just fallen people from the line of Seth? People that were righteous in one time and wanted to, to go in with God, but later on corruption will come and defile their hearts. No one really knows. The root word, nephal, really has this idea of fallen. Were they just fallen angels or were they fallen people? Scotty mentioned the book of Enoch last week. In one Enoch, we don't hold it as canon, so don't worry, I'm not going to get heretical on you. It's an apocryphal book. We don't hold it as canon because it's a very new book, probably only written within about 500 years ago. It's a long time away from when it was meant to be written. But it does say within that there's some stuff that correlates with scripture and it talks about the Nephilim 
came about because of these demonic angels having sex with women. But it could quite easily just be these men. Come from the line of Seth. Mighty men, warriors that God wanted to use and they become corrupt and fallen. Maybe we could talk about the ark and how big it was. 510 feet long. One and a half football pitches. This massive, great building of a boat. It was about four, the height of a four-story building. Could have probably held something like 120,000 sheep. One of the biggest vessels. And when we think about the ark, don't think about a little canoe or a rowing boat. We're talking about something massive. And there's so much we could talk about. Or maybe we could talk about the flood itself. And the fact that it covered the whole earth. And how can, we, how can we know that it covered the whole earth? Surely it didn't really. Maybe it was just local. Well, first of all, the Bible tells us it did. And so I believe the Bible. <laughs> Secondly, if you look at geology, you can look at places like the Grand Canyon or the Himalayas, and you'll see there's evidences of these catastrophic floods. There are even uh, marine fossils right up miles above sea level that could never have got there unless there was a flood. The way the sediments have been laid down, the way that they bend and don't crack, can only have come through large sediment deposits being brought about through floodwaters. Chris will probably talk about some local stuff that he's discovered down in Plymouth which talks about these ideas of a flood that must have covered the earth. And could we talk about that and how God wanted to just come and re-cleanse the world and bring it into something new and that we can hold on to the truth of God's word with integrity knowing that our science and our geology all fit into what the word of God says. But I don't want to spend hardly any time on any of that. I want to talk about what was the purpose of the flood. What do we learn from Noah? You know, I want us to come away with something that will cause us to be somebody like Noah. We looked at Enoch last week. These were men that walked with God. I want us to go away with something that will cause us to walk in the way that God has enabled us to walk through His Spirit and cause us into this walk with Him. The first thing we read about with Noah is this, in verse 8. Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. Goes on to say, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So the first thing I want us to grasp is this. God is calling us to be holy, to be righteous, just like Noah. The Bible says this, be holy, this is God speaking, not me, be holy for I am holy. Yahweh Makedesh is the name given to God. It means the God who sanctifies, makes us into the image he originally created us to be, his image. He is looking for a holy people. And I want to throw this out for a moment, that God is not a tolerator of sin. And it is not good enough for us to say, ah oh man, it's just a little sin in my life. It's just something, it's a little habit that I've got. It's just something that I fall into now and again. It's okay, God will deal with it in his time. And what that really means is I don't want to deal with it now. God does not tolerate sin. We, we, we shouldn't tolerate it. We're so easily embracing it. Oh, it's okay. I'm just a fallen person. God still loves me. It's all all right. And your God is a holy God. And he's looking for a righteous, holy people. The reason why Jesus died and rose again was to take from you and me our sinful nature and give us his nature so that we're no longer producers of sin, but we're producers of the righteousness. That's the goodness of God. And if Jesus has made a way through his death and resurrection and has enabled us through the power of the Holy Spirit to actually walk in it, there are no excuses. No, I was a righteous man. You know, oh yeah, but you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what's gone on in my life. You don't know how difficult it's been and the people around me. 
No, but God does. And he still says, be holy, for I am holy. Noah lived in a time of corruption. Well, we don't really know what's going on while he's hammering away on his gopher wood. We don't really know if people are kind of standing back and laughing at him and mocking him and you know, making it a real hard time. We don't know if they're nicking his hammer, hiding it in the desert somewhere. You know, I'm sure he would have come under oppression and persecution. People would have come against him. Yet he remained true to who God is. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 that we're not to conform to the pattern of this world, but we're meant to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Does the world shape the way you live? Are you shaping the way the world is around you? The challenge is, is that Noah was not shaped by the world around him, but he began to shape his community. He gave an opportunity for them, whether they wanted it or not. And so we see God is called him to be righteous. And this is what I believe happens when we're surrounded by evil. It either consumes us or it refines us. It either consumes us or it refines us. The th- situations you go through, are they going to consume you or are you going to allow God to allow it to refine you? Because I believe it's a massive, massive opportunity. You know, sometimes we can get really pessimistic about what's going on in the world and how negative and dark and bleak it is. I see it as an opportunity. It encourages me to hold deeper onto God, to to go deeper in with Him. It encourages me that as this world tries to mold us and squeeze us and, and break us apart, that we have this amazing opportunity to allow it to refine us with the fire of God's Spirit so that we shine more like Jesus. In the second book of Timothy, chapter one, you read it. He talks about these persecutions, these difficulties going around, and he talks about this idea that it can refine us, that it can make us reflect more of Jesus. You know, I'm paraphrasing what he says, but the context of it is that God will use every one of those situations for our good. So we would be like Noah, a righteous man who will walk with God, will, will know God in our lives. And so that's the second thing that I want us to read. Really Noah, it says in verse 9, Noah walked with God. So he was holy and he's righteous, and he was holy and righteous because he walked with God. And that's why he makes it into the Hebrews Hall of Fame, or the Hall of Faith, should I say. Noah makes it in there like we read about Enoch last week, like Cain and Abel. Well, Cain kind of in a negative sense, but Abel in a good way. That they make it into this hall of faith. Why? Because they walked with God. Look, Hebrews 11. Let's get it open. If you have your Bibles. And if you've got one of these little things, it makes it easier. Hebrews 11. This amazing passage on faith, which we've probably quoted a thousand times, but probably haven't fully grasped or allowed it to infiltrate our lives. We'll start with Enoch, verse 5, Hebrews 11, faith. Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would join it to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In the previous chapter, Genesis 5, from the previous, what we've been reading, Genesis 6, it says that Enoch walked with God. He had this intimate, close relationship with God. And he lived in a way that he trusted and truly believed that God existed. And if God exists, nothing is impossible. And if God exists, he will be true to what he says. And that what he says is this, that the people that seek after God get rewarded. We get rewarded by looking more like Jesus. We get rewarded by our sin life fading away. We get rewarded by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and seeing people's lives being changed. We get rewarded by giving glory to God. And that reward comes from those who will seek after Him. Are you? Am I? Are we a people that seek hunger, thirst after God? 
You know, we put this 40-day fast in, not because we wanted to follow Lent as people think we are, not that we're against Lent either, just want to make that clear, but because God told us to, because we felt God calling us to this place where we set things aside and we spend time in his word and we allow it to fill our hearts and our lives until our hearts beat like his. And there's something beautiful in the church coming together under the counsel of God knowing that our hearts will be like his as we spend time with him. And so God is calling us to be people that will seek after him, just like Enoch did. But so did Noah. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark. Do you see that? In reverent fear. So he had reverence and he had fear that they went together. He knew who God was and he stood in awe of him and he knew who God was and he feared him. He constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness. How does righteousness come? By faith. If you believe in Jesus this morning, his life became your life because you believed. And when I say believed, I don't just mean I know of God. Satan knows God. The demons know God. They believe there is a God. But I mean belief in a way that faith is continuously put into action. Believe in a way that you actually trust in this God. And you truly, truly know that He is good. It is faith that righteousness, the life of Jesus gets given to us because we believe he is true to his word. And so God gives us this amazing opportunity to walk with him. If you think that Enoch and Noah and these people pre-Jesus were able to walk with God, the holy God, how much more those of us that have now been born into a new life through the Spirit can walk with God. We have this awesome privilege where we can spend time in the presence of a holy God, a God in which we could never have got close to because he was so holy, so different from us, we would be consumed by his holiness. And yet through Jesus, he has made us right so that we can boldly come into relationship with God. And yet, we so casually, casually, hold on to that relationship. Are you excited when you get the opportunity to come together as a body and to hear of God and grow from God and worship God and be in the presence of God? Are you excited when you get a moment of peace? You know, when it's one of those hectic days, you've been traveling all over the place, you may have kids to sort out, work to sort out, shopping to do, housework to do, stuff in the garden, a bit of a DIY project, and suddenly you've got five minutes and you go, yes, I get to spend that with Jesus. Not not that you haven't been spending it with Jesus all the other times. Of course you have. Because in everything you do, do unto God, as the Bible says. But when you just get those moments where there's no other distraction, are you going, yes, I can go and watch. I mean, I I can go and spend time with Jesus. (laughs) I'm preaching to myself here, by the way. (laughs) You know, there is something that God wants to stir in the hearts of his believers, of of his children, of those that he loves that causes us to see that there is nothing that truly compares to God. We called Mike and Micah, Scott was talking about names, and we called last week, and we called Mike and Micah because his name means who is there like God. So every time I call out his name, Micah, (laughs) I'm saying who is there like God? And sometimes I need to remember that. (laughs) But in seriousness, wow. Just imagine this, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, no one else like him and ever will be like him. You, me, we get to hang out with him. What a privilege, eh? 
What a privilege that we can be righteous because of Jesus and we can walk with God in intimacy and closeness because of the finished work of Christ. I want to stir our hearts. I, my, my, my prayer has been over this fasting time that, you know, as a church, wow, there's something will just keep burning. There will be something deposited in us, a love that will continuously burn, that will continuously burn. And so we are so hungry. You know, you know that whole thing, Hebrews 10 thing, that's our, our verse for this year, you know, about, about spurring one another on in love and good works, about not neglecting to meet together. How casually we stop meeting together for other things. Well, it might be because we don't like what's going on in the church and I just pray, say, pray about it and get through that because Jesus loves his church. And it might be there's just so many other distractions and pulls. And I'm not just talking about a Sunday, I'm talking about gathering as God's people whenever we get the opportunity because something of Jesus gets reflected in that. And, and something of Jesus should, should get moved in us so that when we're not together, we're living this day for him. You know, there's been pings going on on the WhatsApp this week about people who have made commitments to Jesus, people that have been, been able to share Jesus with others. And it's just great to hear how God's church, you, his people, are moving in this day. And I believe it's only going to increase. And so my next point is, yes, we are righteous because of Jesus. Yes, we can walk with God. But are we truly ready? You know, if we go back to Genesis 6, we'll see that God speaks to Noah. I mean, verse 22, Noah did this. And he just said, build this crazy ark. Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. And then he goes on to seven, in chapter 7 to talk about how he put into practice what God had asked of him. If we're walking with God, if we're standing in the righteousness of God, it enables our spiritual ears to be able to hear what God's saying and doing. And then the next thing we have to do is we've got to act on it. You know, are we ready to hear and are we ready to act? I don't know about you, but when I read through the Bible, sometimes you hear these, these, these crazy things like God says to Noah. And I've always wondered, did Noah hear him verbally? Did he literally hear the voice of God? But was it more of an impression? Was it that he was spending enough time with God and listening to God that there was an impression in his inner being, in his spirit, and he heard God, not in an audible way, but through his spirit? Well, we don't know, but that's the kind of life God wants us to, to nurture, to cultivate. One that will hear the voice of God and respond, that will get out of the noise and the busyness and the to-do list, this, the massive agendas that we've got, and just listen and hear and be willing to respond. And you know, so to respond sometimes, it's going to mean we're going to have to put some of our ideals away. I don't know about you, but if I was Noah in the desert... Let's just picture where Noah is. He's in the desert. He's not like right next to the sea or anything. He's not like on the coastline. He's, in, he's further inland. And if God said to me, build the biggest vessel ever be built in history in the desert, I might be going, that, pardon? No, no, you, you meant... No, you meant build a house for shade out of the sun. That's what you meant. <laughs> In, indulge me for a minute. I'm going to give a very silly illustration. What was God's, I got up one day and said to you guys, we're going to build a ski slope on the beach. <laughs> we're going to build a ski slope, and it's going to, not, not a dry ski slope, a proper ski slope right on the beach. And, and this is what you've got to do. You've got to sell everything. Because I don't know about, if you know, but to have a big arc costs lots of resources. We don't read it in the, in, in, the, in the text, but he would have literally had to put all his resources into building this thing. You know, I, I know they can go and chop things down. We have trouble with de deforestation today, but, but, but there is a huge amount of resources going into that. He wouldn't have been able to, to work as, uh, on the land as, in the way he could have done. He would have had to give up things. And, you know, so if I said to you, let's sell what we have, we're going to build a ski slope. God has said, he's going to rain down the snow. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> you would be going, Dave, you have finally lost it. We've heard some great things from you in the past. We've heard some crazy things from you in the past. But this takes the biscuit. And there may be, if I'm, well, it'd probably just be my family still sitting here next Sunday. <laughs> and even they might not be in there. <laughs> I use the illustration because that is how ridiculous it was for Noah. Would we hear it if God spoke? Or have we got it so figured out here? God works like this. God doesn't waste resources. God just wants to feed the homeless. And I'm not saying he doesn't. We're mass into community. In fact, those guys that came were, were so blown over by the way that we're connecting with communities of church. So these things are important. But, but we have these ideals in our heads. The way it should be. The way it should look. And God's like kind of tapping on it going, hey, but I want something different. Are you going to hear me? There's something else. You're going to miss out on this amazing opportunity. Wouldn't it be gutting if God spoke to you? So say it was Noah's neighbor that he actually spoke to. And he went, no, it it was the goat curry just repeating on myself. That wasn't God. And then you see Noah build this ark and suddenly you're being swept away by the sea. You'd be kind of gutted going, I wish I really heard God. You know, that is why God is wanting to speak to us as a church. He wants us to be ready, to have an ear to listen, to put aside what we believe things should look like or be like, and be ready to hear and respond to him. Why? Because Jesus is coming again soon. If you look in Matthew 24 and 25, if you look in 2 Peter Chapters 2 and chapters 3. If you look in 1 Peter, you will see that it refers to this day that Jesus is coming soon. And they liken it to Noah. They liken it to Noah. They said like Noah, in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, and they were merry. And they did not see the disaster that was coming. Matthew 24, 25 tells us about the virgins and the lamps. It's after this. It's just talked about the days of Noah. And then goes on to the virgins and the lamps. And it talks about these ten virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And five of them were ready. They had oil. Five of them didn't, but they all slept. And then Jesus turns up. And first of all, that shakes me. I'm thinking, okay, we might be ready. We might be saying, okay, I'm going to get myself ready. But am I sleeping? Is the church sleeping today? Will we see it when he comes? And secondly, have I got, am I ready? Have I got myself, am I filled with the Spirit? Am I walking in step with the Spirit every day? Because those virgins are the brides of the bridegroom. And what is the church? The church is the bride. The parable is a relatable parable to the church because the church is the bride of Christ and the bridegroom is coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. Don't go and get facelifts. <laughs> it means that people that are holy, that are set apart, that are walking with God, that are righteous, that are ready. And the, the scary thing about that parable is that half of them end up in hell. church of Jesus Christ meant to be ready meant to be full of the spirit and man you know I might be making a big theological statement here and I don't have time to unpack it so you can wing me emails or call me at the end but it's sobering to think that these guys missed Jesus coming they thought they had it right they thought they had it sorted they were sleeping on their laurels as it goes and they missed Jesus coming And you know the crazy thing straight after that parable is the parable of the talents. Which says what are you doing with what God's given you? You're not meant to be asleep. You're not meant to not be ready. But you are meant to be using what God has given you. Because a day is coming when Jesus will return. There is a day coming when there will be no more choices. And the church of Jesus Christ have a privilege to walk with God, be holy like God, to be able to hear the voice of God and be ready in any moment to be able to speak into it and share Jesus so that when he comes, when he comes, more people will be in his kingdom and less people will be lost. 
I don't know what you listen to or what you believe, but I truly believe this. There is hell and there is heaven. There is a future with Jesus and there is a future without him. There's a future that begins the day you say yes to him and will carry on for eternity. But hell is a real place. And when Jesus comes again, it will be populated by anyone that does not take the name of Jesus. It will be populated by everybody that has turned their back on Jesus. It will be populated by Satan and his demons and every human being that did not respond to the call of Christ. And if you're happy with that, then I pray that God will... Let me use a good word. (laughs) Challenge you. To your core. He will wreck you to your core. He will wreck me to my core. I cannot live with that reality and be silent. I cannot live with this reality. And God doesn't want us to either. Because God has made an ark through his son Jesus. And we're meant to be people that are pointing people to this ark who is Jesus. Let me finish with this. In the first book of Peter, it says that Jesus went down, he preached to the captives and set him free and that he came, became like an ark. And it's associated with the waters of baptism. That as we take hold of Jesus and our old life is buried under the waters of baptism, under the flood of God. We come out as new creations. An old life is left dead and buried and stinking. And a new life that reflects Jesus comes. If you have made that choice, live in the reality of it. Get yourself before God and choose to believe him Choose to trust him. Choose to allow his life to flood yours until you become his righteousness. Choose to be a people that will walk with him, seeking after him day in and day out. Choose to be a people that are ready in any moment to share the truth of Jesus with anyone that you meet. Because Jesus is coming again. Are we ready? And if you don't know Jesus this morning, if you have not said yes to him, if you want to know this life that will transform your life and leave an old life buried and you'll find a totally different new life found in God, then I want to encourage you this morning that when the music's playing, come and grab somebody so we can pray with you. If you want to choose him today, the invitation is for you.